two. <laughs> and we have here, you know him, you love him, you play him, Roger Clark. And the man with the plan, Benjamin Iron Hills. Hi there. What an amazing turnout. Thanks, everyone. Is everyone having have a good con so far? Yeah. Who, we got here yesterday. It, was somebody, it started Thursday, right? Uh, yeah. Nice one. Yeah, this is some of the best cosplays I've ever seen. Uh, great, some great Arthurs and Duchess and Sadies and... Yeah, you guys are awesome. It's been a very warm welcome. So good to see you. Seen any mashups yet? No, no, not well. I saw John Marston in tights. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> it's a good look. I figured you'd see a Deadpool one of you by now, but uh, yeah. All right, you just planted the seed. Huh? Right. Someone's working on it right now. Well, I thought I'd break the uh, ice with you know something from the game. Little Texas Hold'em, maybe to start off. Oh, I like that. <laughs> what What are the stakes? Uh, well, I asked, and we really couldn't get any stakes, so. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'll play for something more valuable. Okay. How about uh, first question? Sounds good. Okay. So I don't know, Texas Hold'em, or five card. <laughs> I think Hold'em's what we play in Valentine. Ah, okay. So. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, I guess I'll hold up the one. Let's see. Burn oh, one and turn them, huh? <laughs> Here's the flop. Okay. <laughs> King, it doesn't seem like a proper shuffle. King of Cubs, eight of Cubs, eight of Spades. Alright. So, I guess you're big blind. <laughs> what do I bet with? <laughs> Uh, funny money like you're doing right sure. there. Right. How about we bet with, all right, uh, so uh, you you do speak a lot about how in the in the game it's uh, it's not just voice work, but it's it's performance work, it's, uh, it's motion capture. Uh, I guess the first thing out of my mouth would, when I thought about that was, did you get to ride a horse in motion capture? <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, well, you did. <laughs> They had about a week of horses in the volume, do, capturing all the animations for the horses. And uh, although I wasn't present, I don't think you were. No, I wasn't present. But we had our version of horses. Yeah, it would be, it would be dimensionally accurate. So it would be an oil drum with a saddle on it and four little pipes <laughs> that would be the same height as a horse with a little horse's head. And that's what we predominantly worked with. And then the, the amazing animators, after the fact, then would be able to put in the motion of either a canter or a gallop or a trot and what have you, but uh, I, they did have a whole day of the horses just going in and around and running around and literally running around in circles, and they told me it was quite hard to get the balls to stay on the fur, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that they pooped a lot. Well, they didn't, didn't, have have horse, <laughs> didn't have horse-sized leotards that they could slip in. And, and <laughs> That's a good question. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be, want to be the one that put it on the horse. They did have dog-sized. Yes. Oh. Leotards. Yeah. Yes. There were some dogs in the game that were dogs of the uh, developers and the animators. They made cameos in the game. Very well trained, but they would wag their tails so much the ball would often fall off on the end. You know. Uh, so how does how did the state of uh, how did the state of motion capture change uh, over the course of uh, working on? It, did it change during the course of the project? And yeah. have you worked on other ones where you had to work with uh, like? previous technologies and it, it advanced a lot? Well, the, the first Red Dead, uh, well not the, the, the second Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption, which is technically the second Red Dead, um, was the first game, to my understanding, that Rockstar did that was full performance capture. Uh, and, but it was, uh, they still had, did you see one of the old ones they had in, uh, in the studio claim? In one of the studios they had the old one. But it was essentially, it, it was jury rigged. It was the, the inside of like a construction helmet, and then there was a big, almost like a duck bill that was coming off of it, and there was a little camera that was getting everything the face did. By the time we got to the second, it was a proper helmet that was, for those of us that were there a lot, it was custom made to our heads. Yeah. Uh, mine is big. Um, 
And then there's a, a pole coming off of it, like a tusk, and with a camera on it. And when we started the project, they were SD cameras, and then, you know, as the technology unfolded in front of our eyes, they switched to HD, and then the light then became a lot less bright, which was much less distracting for the performer, which was really cool. And there was lots of other advancements, too, that were made during the, period, the five years that we worked on Red Dead, but, you know, it's over my head. My first foray into performance capture was a game about a dozen, maybe 13 years ago now, and even just the, seeing the difference in the technology from that to when I, my first day on Red Dead 2 was amazing, because, you know, they used to have the balls on your face, and then uh, if you start running around or you got sweaty, it'd start falling off, or if you just wanted to wipe your nose like you would, like in a scene, like any normal human action that you might do, you know, so the technology... As it gets more and more advanced, it, it allows the performer a lot more freedom to, uh, to do those little nuances and idiosyncratic human behaviors that we have grown to love and see in video games now. You know? So uh, I guess when you do voiceover work, it's, uh, uh, well, I, I guess a key difference would be that you'd have the script in front of you. You wouldn't really have that for motion capture, would you? You'd have to actually memorize your lines and be like a theater performance. Some actors were caught off guard. They would, they would show up imagining that it was not the main... The, the, the uh, prevailing presumption is, is that a video game is going to be voice work. And that was never this. I did, I would say, probably 5% of the work that I did was in the booth. And the rest of it was with other actors on the soundstage. And as Dutch, I would end up with... Uh, you might have noticed he has some monologues. <laughs> I don't know, I haven't watched, the, I haven't played the game, so... The, the, the first batch of pages I got after I signed this NDA, which effectively says, if you break this NDA, we will kill you, <laughs> all of your family, and everyone you went to junior high school with. Um, but I get, I, get, I get these pages, including this monologue that is two pages long. It was, yeah, it was, it was huge, and it's about, and, and, you know, as an actor, typically... You got a script to memorize, you get a buddy over and you run lines. I can't have a buddy over to run lines because I'm bound by this non disclosure agreement. So I am on my own trying to put this all together. So two years into the gig, when, or three or four, when someone would show up thinking it's voiceover, <laughs> and they had, I remember one guy came into the green room and he said to me, uh, how, how much do they care about these lines being, you know, perfect? And I was like, well, you know, the owner of the company wrote it, so I think <laughs> you probably want to be on off book. Uh, but watching other people struggle with my pain was enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people we work, we've worked with, I think there's close to a thousand people on that project for doing the performance capture aspect of it. And for lots of those actors, it was their first foray into the, the medium, you know, so it was really interesting. They would always do the same thing, because when you walk into the volume, uh, you have what you, what's what was called previs on the screen, so that you can see, for lack of a better word, your avatar within the actual environment that you're acting in, whereas the volume would have a dimensionally accurate set. You would look on the screen, but much like that one over there. So, I'm Roger Clark, we would look on that, and it would be Arthur pointing, you know? And so the actors would come in, and they always do the same thing. They'd go, oh, wow. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, or in some cases, when they didn't learn their lines, they're just standing like this. <laughs> did, it do did it do eyeball tracking? Yeah, the face cam would pick all that up. And even in the booth, we still did face facial capture, because the animators would need to sync the lips. Well, they correct that if you were, you know, forgot something and was just... <laughs> they just would, they uh, wouldn't use it. We'd just go, do it again, Rod, you know? <laughs> Well, that was a fun distinction between the first game and the second game. Oh, yeah. Was that in the first game, we, they, they didn't yet know how to cut. So if you go and you watch Red Dead, like the scene with the professor and Tom and I, that was the first one I ever did. Nostas. Not Nostas. Did I you also, know he was Nostas, too? I, don't shoot me, Mr. Marston. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that was a temp track. It wasn't, that's a longer story. <laughs> but all 
all of those scenes in the first one were, were a single take because they couldn't edit. There's one scene where they did, a, they added a bit of dialogue. I think when I shoot the woman in the in the back of the head, because such a nice nice fella. Um, they added one John saying Easy Dutch it was ADR, but the rest it was all single takes. So we would have days of rehearsal where the build team the ones who would build these sets, these dimensionally accurate sets that we were on, would learn how they were going to build the sets for a given day of, of performance capture. And, and we, as the actors, would work with the director and each other to find out how we were going to play it. When, we, when it came time to do the second one, the engine was so well tuned, and we would not, we didn't have rehearsal days and capture days. We would we'd do the scenes, we'd leave, and then the genius build team would come in. And then they build a steamship or a couple of horses or a cliff or a barn or whatever they had to build. Uh, but finally, we could, on the second one, you could screw up in the middle of the take and not throw out the whole take, which was a relief. There was a difference, indeed. Yeah, I would imagine it's hard to do cuts when you're doing motion capture because you're, it's not exactly that you just have room tone for somebody's body. Right. <laughs> Well, they, they figured it, but it was, there was, when we did the scene on the cliff, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> uh, on, Red, on the first Red Dead, we did the scene on the cliff, and so we've got these helmets on, and at this point, there was a version of it in the, in the, in the new one, but in the, it, when we were doing the first one, everybody would have their little uh, monitors with their faces on it, there was the sort of the close-up that the camera was getting, and they'd stay on even when people were going to have breaks. It's no uh, secret that, that uh, Rob Weedoff is a smoker. I was, too, at the time. So we'd be off on our smoke breaks, and the camera would still be on, and you could see the people outside having a cigarette. <laughs> but we were doing the scene on the cliff with our time has passed, and our director, Rod Edge, uh, was there. He, when Dutch throws the gun off the cliff, uh, Rod caught it. And if he didn't like the take, because we couldn't do multiple, we couldn't edit. He would stop the tape before we'd get to me falling off the cliff, because there was a big knob in the back of my head. Do you know this story? Yeah, uh, it's been a while. <laughs> but there was this big knob in the back of my head, and I could only hit the mat so many times before I was going to become a prima donna and storm off the set. So uh, we, uh, we had a tape where... It's me and Rob, and we're doing this scene, and I'm on the edge of the cliff, and I'm wearing cowboy boots, and there's a little lip, it's about a foot off the ground, and there's a crash mat behind it. And I'm saying, uh, you know, when I'm gone, they'll find another monster. And, uh, and then my, my boot clipped on the edge of the cliff, and I'm starting to fall backwards, and I go, our time has passed! And I, go, <laughs> I fell off the bank. <laughs> and, and Rod was so sincere, he was like, did you need to do that, <laughs> crazy person? I said, no, of course I didn't mean to do that. And I said, but I'd really love to have been able to see the expression on my face. And Rod goes with a twinkle in his eye, oh, we can do that. <laughs> so they put it up on the big screen, me going, oh, time. <laughs> that was a fun day. <laughs> Well, you mentioned you'd already done, you had done uh, Noctis in the first one as well as... Uh, well, Noctis is my, is 6'6". Six, six. I'm 6'6". Six, six. Dutch is six feet. So uh, the idea was was that I was just going to do Noctis as... Uh, as effect, effectively, I was just a body double. And, but I, you know, I'm an actor, so I, I, I treated it like that it was my role, even though I knew it wasn't. And they ended up liking the work. It, it was the thing that I was really, I think, among the things I'm most proud of in my career was a few internet postings back then that said, how can the company that hired that actor who was so good playing Dutch Vanderlyn hire that terrible actor who played the Native American robot? Uh, and I was like, hey, it's me. I'm, I, I'm great and I suck in the same thing. That's wonderful. Range. It's called range. <laughs> Uh, did, did you do any other? Uh, I, I know uh, in a lot of uh, in a lot of voice and production work, it's uh, uh, there. There's always always bit parts and uh, quick voices that need to be filled in. Was that sort of thing uh, standard with with motion capture? Or was did you have 
Did you body double for other ones? And did you have, I guess, for lack of a better term, stunt doubles that would do harder stuff? Yeah. Uh, we did everything except the major stunts, but then often we would stand in and do body doubles when they needed an extra body as well. And here's, uh, our, here's another fun fact. Um, spoiler alert. But... Um, at the very end, when the credits are rolling, after you've completed the epilogue, is John, and you know those little montage bits that they have. And there's one where you see Mary visiting Arthur's gravestone. You guys remember that part? I was Mary. <laughs> Got to be at your own funeral. <laughs> and of course, the real Mary, Julie Chesnick, was amazing to work with. But she, you know, we, we just, I just, she wasn't in that day. So, Raj, do you mind standing by your gravestone and looking sad? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> well, since now they can do editing, uh, were you able to do any, were, were any scenes improvised or was it pretty much by the book? I mean, there was, we, we had worked so long with each other that, uh, you know, there was a huge, huge bond of mutual trust going on. We learned to trust the writing, and the writers also trusted our interpretation of the characters themselves, too. So there was a little bit of flexibility on it, but, you know, to be honest, uh, we, we knew that they knew what they were doing, and then we, but at the same time, if we ever had any other ideas, we knew we would always be listened to, too. So, uh... For the most part, we kind of stuck to the page, but you know, there was the few ad libs. I can't think of anything off the top of my head now, but if I do, I'll, I'll shout it out later. There's a couple. There's a couple. Yeah. I, I do remember there was one time we were doing, we were walking through Guarma. I don't even know if it made it in to the game or not. Although I've, I've made this mistake in the past, where I've said things were cut, and then I played the game a second time, and it's like, oh, it wasn't cut. I just didn't see it. Um, but we were walking through Guarma. And, and uh, Fuso, not Fuso, who's the guy that helps? Hercule. Hercule uh, says something about, like, you guys are going to be hunted all over this island. And I, on one take, said, yeah, we did a lot of that. <laughs> and I felt kind of conspicuous throwing that in there. So we did the second take of it, and I didn't put it in. And our director, Rod, said, what happened to that line? And I said, oh, it wasn't a line. I said, it's, I like that one. Keep it in. <laughs> Although I think it got cut. But there it is. <laughs> Uh, so how long did this uh, project take compared to some of the other performances you've done? Um, sounds like it's a rather involved process, considering the, just the scale of it. Yeah, I, uh, I auditioned for it the, at the beginning of 2013. And my first day on the job was August of 2013. And my last day on the job was August of 2018. That's some time. I, did, I found out around the day, I got the, the call saying they wanted to know my dates for an untitled, I knew what the hell it was, but, uh, <laughs> but I, so I knew about it, I think, July of 13. I signed the NDA October 13. My first day on set was January 14. But I like to, not just to pitch other things that I did, although see Ann and the Lost and Belco experiment. But in the time it took to do Red Dead, I shot a film in South America. It got cut, it got it premiered, it made it to home video, and then I shot a Marvel movie. That got cut, that got premiered, that got to home video, and I still couldn't talk about the fact that I had been working on Red Dead for nearly five years. I mean, so it's, it's a lot of time. But it was well, I mean, well spent. There's not a thing to complain about. Yeah, I think it's a few dozen hours in the can eventually is what we got. It's comparable to maybe five or six seasons of a TV show, and no matter what they went in writing and, and recording that went in. Five or six seasons of a TV show that you're not allowed to talk about. Yeah. That doesn't and go on TV. And that nobody has seen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So with a project that big and that long, were there any, were there, I'm sure the characters maybe gone through a bit of a metamorphosis, uh, but it's all going to be in one game. 
Did you have to do any reshoots? Did the characters develop quirks or habits that you later went back and added into earlier scenes and shots? You know, I think they approached the project at the beginning. They had a kind of skeletal image of what it was going to be, but they didn't make any very fine, you know, very fine and detailed commitments early on because they knew that they were going to be molding and adapting depending on the actors and seeing how what things worked and what things didn't. So yeah, there were a few tweaks. You know, um, I had to change a fair bit because. Uh, at the beginning, Arthur was very angry, much, much more angry than what he eventually turned out to be. So we were able to tweak that a little bit. I know that they spent ages trying to find the right fit for Charles Smith, which they eventually did with the amazing Monsieur Uh Yes, yes Monsieur. So there was always a constant evolution of characters and whatnot, but you know, obviously we had to be keep in mind the consistency as well. And for the consistency as the playable character is a bit of a double-edged sword too, because you know I am my actions are as morally ambiguous as what the player decides to do with me. You know, so it's up to you whether or not Arthur is loyal, a dishonorable guy, or an honorable guy. You know, so. Uh, what I, my biggest challenge, especially for the latter half of the story, would be to come up with lines as truthful and as honestly as I could that would suit both an honorable path and a dishonorable path. And of course, the, the amazing writing by Dan Hauser and Rupert uh, Humphreys, thank you, and Michael Unsworth, that helped that a great deal. But you know, when you when you know you're the playable character, that was one of the challenges. I had. There's also, the, because of the tech, you know, I ended up, a lot of the time, I'd have a big speech. All the time I'd have a big speech. <laughs> and at the end of the speech, I'd say, you two go up and do that, and you two go up and do that. Or, and you can go with them, or you can go with them. <laughs> and then, five months later, they'd be playing through and they'd be figuring out, oh, you know what, we've got to send two different people over there and two different people over there. So... You re-record the dialogue for that. So now it's Mr. Pearson is waiting for you over there, and uh, Mr. Bell's waiting for you over there. Okay, all right. And then and then they change it again. But the the, the, the thing that ended up happening is that there are some scenes in there. Um, I can think of a couple in particular that took forever to get. Just so. But they feel, all of the scenes feel so immediate, like they're just happening. And that's a tribute to the writing, to the animating. But because of the technology, there are scenes in there where there is performance capture that we did in 2014, booth work that we did in 2015, additional performance capture that we did in 2017. And by the way, the actor playing that role got replaced. And so it's a whole. So there's this sort of Frankenstein of these scenes into what we ended up with. Yeah. It, it was amazing to be a, a participant in that process. In 2018, I was finishing scenes that I had started in 2013. <laughs> yeah. I guess it would be almost like. Uh, if you were working on some sort of TV production, going back and reshooting season one shots. Yeah, with the continuity nightmare that that would cause uh, in live action. Can you imagine? What if your actor got fat? <laughs> <laughs> and lost his hammer. Oh, wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> He's got loads more gray hair now. What do we do? Uh, were, were there any, uh, with a long production like this, were, were there any uh, actors that you had, that they had gotten for a part, were perfect for it, but then they had schedule conflicts later on and they had to be replaced? For sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, John O'Kray, uh, who was the second uncle, uh, Spider Madison. Spider Madison so, played him in the original. And uh, so we had a wonderful John O'Craig who played Arthur, and unfortunately he passed away halfway through the shoot, and then he was replaced by the amazing James Matt. Ma James McBride, who yes. uh, you know had to had to do the Herculean task of ADR and all of John's lines, but thankfully, you know, Rockstar did keep. Whenever you hear Uncle singing, it's still John O'Craig. So, you know, and, and they, they made they part made of the map O'Craig's Run is named after our compatriot John, yeah. that we all miss terribly. Rest in peace. 
So yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. So, uh, I noticed that you guys had come down here from, uh, from uh, the Motor City Con. Uh, so, uh, and while I was doing some research for this, uh, for this panel, I noticed that uh, you had been to Kuwait uh, earlier in the year. So, what's it like traveling uh, to American cons and then versus like foreign country cons? I mean, I know it's a little different. Uh, you know, I know you're from Boston. Um, uh, Kuwait and Detroit are exactly the oh, same. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I know you're from Boston, and you're oh, I am from Boston. not. Uh, I, I'm from Jersey. A, I'm, I was born in Jersey. Ah. I know I sound like that. Yeah, Kuwait was the first one we did. Uh, that was in January, and it's the only one where, obviously Canada, we're not understanding, but it's the only one outside of the U.S. we did as well. We're still kind of new to this, you know, and, and it, what's been really amazing is when we sit and meet you guys and find out how many of, for you, it's your first con as well, you know, and it just means so much to us that it, you took the time to come out and attend the con for the first time because you liked our work and you liked the game, so that's amazing. But the support, the fans haven't been, they're, they're kind of the same no matter where you go in the world, you know. That was the overwhelming thing to me about Kuwait was to go to a place I, I never imagined that I would I would go. I, I was very happy to. Um, but you mean folks can cosplay literally on the other side of the world, and you start to recognize that because of our association with Rockstar and what they have achieved as a company over all of these years, that we get to intersect in popular culture in a in a manner that is literally global. And at a time, I figure, when, when there's a lot of friction in this world, to be participating in a story that is uh, connecting with people all over the planet, literally, uh, it's humbling is not a sufficient word. Yeah. I think you're, um, I guess, uh, do you imagine that you'd be, be visiting all these sort of things? Or did, did you picture yourself... Uh, I guess what I want to ask is, what were you really doing before getting into this? Because um, is this uh, kind of your main gig that you started, or uh, you mean, as a, as an actor? Do you mean? Uh, I guess acting in general, like. Uh, well, I I got my degree from NYU uh, in '96 and spent a lot of time working very hard for no money in downtown theater in New York in the '90s, and then. I moved out to Los Angeles in 99 because I heard they needed another actor and I thought I could help. Um, and I, uh, you know, my bread and butter has been pretty much TV, big guy number two, I'm your man, uh, large Russian, I'm pretty good at that. Uh, you know, I'd often be the guy that you think is, he's the killer and then I'm not the killer. I mean, but, uh, you, but you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a hell of a thing and a wonderful thing to be a, a, a character actor, a, a, a journeyman actor. Uh, and you, you know, the sort of natural state as an actor is is unemployed. So you're 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 basically treading water. So for all you kids who are really excited about the possibility, just know <laughs> you're spending most of the time treading water, and then every once in a while. A little boat will come along, and that's a part. And sometimes the part's going to be like a little dinghy, and you get in the dinghy, and you're there, and then back in the water, treading water. And then every once in a while, something like Red Dead comes along, and that's it's like a giant yacht, and you're happy to stay on it for as long as you can. But eventually, you're going back in the water, and that's just the the, the, the nature of things. But it's not as though I can't speak for Roger, but I expect him he's going to agree. It's not like I woke up. One morning and went, you know what, I think a cowboy video game <laughs> is exactly what I need. <laughs> I've been in, uh, my first professional gig was in 2000, and uh, I trained in Britain, and I started out doing theater and voiceover. Uh, I've done theater all over the world, um, a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of Arthur Miller, etc. 
My first voiceover gig was for a slot machine called Reservoir Frogs. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a takeoff of Reservoir Dogs. No. Yeah. So for, and they wanted a Michael Madsen sound like, you know, and I, so I would just go, cherries, bananas. <laughs> Depending, of course, which fruit appeared. <laughs> So that was my first foray into that. That was quite fun. You had to be a frog and... Yeah, yeah, man. And then remember, one of the frogs was... Frogs don't have ears. So it was a frog <laughs> holding a human ear and a gun. And he was kind of smiling. And oh, look what I just did. You know. right, what, was, what was this doing on your head? <laughs> you did you a favor cutting that off. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll... but Ben's absolutely right, you know. Uh, you know, anyone who's been at it long enough should knows that uh, that any any work is a blessing, you know, and, and the joy is in the doing. But uh, this is beyond our wildest dreams because we never thought that we would get so much joy seeing how our work was received, too. You know. Oh, so uh, I did have a question that's uh, a little more. It's a little ambiguous, at least with, uh, with this game, considering that you have the ability to make the moral choices as a player for your, for your character. Uh, were there any decisions that you saw your character, you depicted your character to be like, that you either admired or kind of disdained? Well, um... <laughs> I don't know. You know, I guess you got to do both. <laughs> you know, I knew that, you know, the, it's, it's un, unlike any other medium, you know, playing as Arthur, I knew that I had even less ownership of the character than I would do if it was a play or if it was a television series. And, and I knew that the player was going to have an equal entitlement of ownership to Arthur as I did. So I guess going back to one of my earlier answers, you know, one of my main duties that I perceived to be anyway, was to come up with enough ambiguity so that it would work regardless of how the player behaved as it, but yet still had come up with something that was still definitively a clear character, you know? So I guess one of the ways that I justified that to myself was to remind myself that people are complicated, you know? And we contradict ourselves all the time. And as long as it's done in a way that uh, justifies the motivation of the character, whether it be, you know, Arthur is in a gang and he does nasty stuff, and, but he does it out of a sense of loyalty and duty to his gang and loved ones. So I just always would remind myself of the complexity of the human spirit, for lack of a better term, you know, and... And any time I felt, Arthur wouldn't do that, I considered it my job to find out a way in which he truthfully would. You know, I had to come up with the motivation to make it work, to make it seem real. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Dutch didn't do anything. <laughs> Dutch did nothing wrong. <laughs> Somebody has faith. I like that. I like that. <laughs> You'll send the t-shirts appear later, I'm sure. It, it was um, interesting to have the arc that I had that was kind of prompt. I, so I knew... Hell of an arc. I, I, knew, I knew what we owed, because I knew where we ended up. And that was pretty lucky compared to uh, other characters. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to die, um, which was kind of great. Like, it, it, it allowed me... To, to do certain things, and they had my back on them. Like, you don't see Dutch crouching very often. He doesn't go into low cover very often. People start shooting at him, he just walks. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really thought was pretty badass. Uh, but it was this interesting thing that we sort of, we, it seemed to me in the, in, the, in, the, in the production of it that we really got the heyday of the gang set before they started throwing the crazy stuff at, at me, yeah. and crazy is the wrong word for Dutch, trouble, I guess, is maybe closer, but so it was, it was a bit of a, a, a it wasn't, um, it wasn't that it was hard to do, but when you're showing up for three months, or four months, and working as, like, this great 
leader who is there with all the answers for everybody, and you go from that to a guy that is uncertain of himself and that is making terrible decisions that are injuring people that I've been caring about in a real profound way. It was, it was an interesting uh, journey, to say the least. And I remember as well as I think anybody that's played it, but the scene with the, the final scene with Micah and Arthur and Dutch on the cliff and knowing how, like, as, as an actor, you want to have a great moment of redemption, for lack of a better word. But instead, I have to go and i got to step on his hand. And I've got to walk, you know, and we're all, again, this is performance capture. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching Roger at the top of his game, wheezing and coughing. And, and, I'm, and I'm the guy that's got to go walk over and step on his hand. Um, it did not make me feel good. So there, are, there were certainly uh, decisions. I do like to think that in the work I was given the room, and, and not just the room, Rod, our director, and, and our writers encouraged the ambiguity of Dutch so that one person can walk away and they could say that Dutch was just a bad man. And I think another person can walk away, hopefully, and say Dutch was confused, or Dutch was led astray, or Dutch was o over his head or overextended, or what have you. I like that there's room in there for interpretation. Yeah. Well, uh, I know that uh, uh, as the playable character, you had to go through many branches of like, okay, if, this, if the character went this way and that way, but uh, I guess as Dutch, you would still have to, all right, if the, char if the main character went this way, how would Dutch, but we need a Dutch, Dutch's reaction to when he did this, when he did this. So there was a, I guess, did you have to, was it, was it, was it trouble to keep and keep all that in your head of like which, which version of uh, Arthur you're, you're dealing with? Not, well, not so much. The, the one thing that I, I remember, I can be cantankerous. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but of, of, of the things that I, I got uh, in a snit about, was having to record this dialogue of if Arthur was treating me disrespectfully at camp. And I was just like, that would not happen. I would not allow it. He would not survive it. But we had to, you know, they, they would explain to me that it's not all, you know, the, the character has some agency, the player is allowed to fuck with you, pardon my friends. And I was like, okay, all right, so begrudgingly. So dynamite <laughs> Who does that? Nobody does that. Okay, all right. Honest. Yeah, Mr. Marston. <laughs> uh, was, it, uh, was it any trouble picking up the character after the first red dead? It was scary. I'll, I'll tell you, it was... Getting into Red Dead Redemption is pretty good. I mean, Amazing. it's a yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Is anyone here played it? And, and, and again, I'm I'm proud of every every role. Of big guy number two, like I said, I am your guy. I swear, go find off center and look at that. I'm proud. I'm not that proud of the work, but <laughs> but to have been a part of Red Dead Redemption, to have done that, uh, it felt like I was, I was justifiably proud to be a part of that. And I was so excited when the call came that we were going to go do it again. But then I started thinking, what if we screw this up? What if this thing that I'm so Unabashed what if the new guy screws it up? What if, yeah. <laughs> what if what if they get another guy in and he screws it up? Although I, you know, if you work with Roger, we talked about that before. We we ended up. You don't often get to to have a, a union as, a, as an artist with another artist. And and we were. I mean, every important scene that I did, I did alongside this man over here. He did not screw it up. I don't think. Does anybody think that Roger screwed it up? Yeah. I hadn't met him yet. <laughs> and I was worried. And I remember showing up for the first day of the sequel, and, or the prequel, and really sincerely going up to Rod Edge and saying, 
what did we screw this up? And Rod told me to trust him. And every time I've trusted that man, things have gone well for me. So uh, that was, but it would still, when we would butt up against, like I expect all of you have played the scene where he and I are on the cliff being chased by the army. I saw those sides and I was like, no, 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 no. It's too close. It's too cute by that. I was afraid that it was going to step on me. And I was, I had, I had doubts, which is what... Because they're the same lines as you all know, right? It, it's echoes. But then when I, I, I actually, I, the day I did it, um, I still wasn't quite sold. But again, I trusted everybody that I was with. There was a couple of weeks later. And so what will happen with some of those scenes is that there'll be multiple passes of those scenes. So we did the scene... Uh, Roger and I in character, and then there were maybe four people that were playing the army that we were dealing with on the cliff. About a session or two later, so this maybe three months later, they're doing pickups for that scene so that the rest of the army is there. And the way they do that is the, the, the original scene is played again, and more actors, sometimes even the same actors, will be in different positions throughout the and I, the original positions are marked out, so you make sure you don't stand in the same place as whether another soldier is, basically. And it was one of those days where I, I was wrapped early. And when you get wrapped early, you take off your leotard, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get back in your civilian clothes. But once you're back in your civilian clothes, you, you're free to move about the volume. You, if you're in your dots, you can't go on the volume because you'll screw everything up. Because the machine will know you're there. But once I was out, I went in and I watched the scene happen again. And I saw what Rod had put together of our work. And I finally was like, okay, actually, not only did I think that that works, I think all of a sudden not only was it a great thing to do, what it does to, to amplify that scene at the end with Rod, with Rob rather, on the clip, is now all of a sudden Dutch at the end is remembering his friend, who he failed so terribly. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and start. Uh...